Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Amelia Holmes, and I am excited to introduce you to our speaker. Cabrea Baumgartner is an Associate Professor of English and American Studies and core faculty in the Women's and Gender Study Department at the University of New Hampshire, where she was named the 2019 Outstanding Assistant Professor. Her research and writing interests focus on African American history, literature, and culture in 19th century New England. She has published numerous scholarly articles and book chapters, as well as essays in the Washington Post, WBUR's blog Cognoscenti, and Historic New England American lawyer Robert Morris, and is going to talk to us tonight about her most recent publication, which I have here with me, uh, In Pursuit of Knowledge. So um, now I'm going to turn it over to Cabrea. Thank you so much. Good evening. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I want to thank um, Amelia Holmes for that introduction and the Nantucket Historical Association for inviting me to be part of this exciting NHA University series. Um, and thank you all for sharing part of your evening with me to discuss African American women and the struggle for educational justice in the 19th century Northeast. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So when I began this project a little over 10 years ago, I could never have imagined that it would become a book and that I would have this chance to share the stories of brave and courageous Black girls and women. So um, this project began when I entered my graduate program to study African American history and literature. And I became fascinated by all that I had learned. But it was the story of the Canterbury Female Seminary that really stayed with me. The Canterbury Female Seminary was established in 1833 in Canterbury, Connecticut, and it welcomed African American girls and women. It was the first seminary of its kind in New England. But 17 months after opening, it closed due to continuous harassment and violence at the hands of white residents who were up in arms that such a seminary existed in their community. Here in the Anti-Slavery Almanac um, of 1839, is a depiction of what happened um, at the Canterbury Female Boarding School. This incident contradicted pretty much everything I knew um, or what I thought I knew at that point about the early 19th century North. And so I started to explore this incident, foregoing questions about the seminary's white proprietor, Prudence Crandall, since scholars had written multiple biographies about her. Instead, I had questions about the young African American women who had attended the seminary. Who were they? Uh, where were they from? And how did they react to this violence? I also began to think about some of the challenges and triumphs that young African American women encountered along their educational journey. I read scholarly books and articles on the common school movement, which is basically the precursor to our modern day um, public education system. I read books about the feminization of the teaching profession, which happened in around the mid 19th century. And I read about race and education and so on. Almost none of these books explored the educational experiences of African American women. And I knew that this line of inquiry presented um, some challenges. And those challenges namely have to do with archival research and archival collections because so few archival collections document early African-American education, a scholar really has to dig and delve to find the sources to tell the stories of African-American people, right? Not to mention African-American girls and women. So I visited um, a dozen repositories from Bowling Green, Ohio to Canterbury, Connecticut. I visited the Prudence Crandall Museum there. 
And then I also went to um, Washington DC and um, searched through repositories there, including the Library of Congress. At each site, I searched in collections and I read letters and newspapers and diaries. I looked at unique sources too, um, such as women's friendship albums, um, carte de visites, right, or it's early photography, um, and seminary catalogs, right? And then there were also some petitions that I could look at. This time-consuming research led me to new analytic analytical insights, which are documented in my book. In Pursuit of Knowledge, Black Women and Educational Activism in Antebellum America tells the interconnected story of African American girls and women fighting for their educational rights in the 19th century Northeast. Now, one of the, the key points um, in my book is that African American women's pursuit of knowledge was not espoused by any one particular charismatic leader or confined to one singular endeavor, but rather it was collective and dynamic. And I'll expand on that point a little later on during in the presentation. So my book maps a network of African American girls and women who had clear and robust plans to reform education. Specifically, they wanted to reverse policies of racial exclusion at public, uh, public schools, private seminaries, and in the teaching profession. I argue in the book that their collective work qualifies them as reformers and as activists. And believe it or not, my book is the first to make that argument, right? To make that claim about these African-American girls and women. My book shows um, that they viewed education as a way to live their purpose. And they wanted to live their purpose amid these severe forms of oppression in the 19th century United States. And in doing so, they modeled a kind of purposeful womanhood, which is I define as being resilient, resourceful, and forward thinking. As I write in the book, African American women talked about leading a purposeful life. At literary societies, they urged each other to, quote, adorn the mind. At female academies, they studied, and at the same time, they learned to be resilient in the face of racial abuse and violence. And on the lecture circuit, they stressed intellectual vitality. And they engaged in protest politics too, petitioning local school committees and state legislatures in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Most notable perhaps was what, um, was what these women sparked in the equal school rights movement. A regional effort to dismantle racial exclusion in public education in New England. Young women like Sarah Ramond, Eunice Ross, Phoebe Boston, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin, and others sought to secure a quality education for themselves and for all children and youth, regardless of race. So there's a forgotten history of school desegregation in the 19th century Northeast. And part of that history is the equal school rights movement, which most people haven't heard of. And to be honest, I hadn't heard of it myself until I started doing this work and this research. The equal school rights movement began roughly in the late mid to late 1830s. And it continued through the 1860s in states like Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island. The major tenets of the movement are outlined here on this slide. The first was this belief in the right of all children to a quality education 
on an equal basis, regardless of race. The second was that activists were oriented toward the goal of democratizing public schools, what we might call today an emphasis on equitable and inclusive practices. And the third was that leaders and activists pursued a range of strategies and tactics from boycotting to um, boycotting schools, filing lawsuits, petitioning local school committees and writing editorials. Through this movement, young African-American women and their allies affirmed black intelligence, right? This idea of wanting and pursuing knowledge. They demonstrated their capability, that is their capacity and desire to achieve, their ambition. And it might seem contrary to what we think of today, that they would have to do this, but this is a part of the oppressive conditions of the 19th century North, which is that there were myths that African Americans were intellectually inferior. Um, so for these women then to demonstrate their capability and their capacity was a, re a rejoinder to those myths. And these women also regarded themselves and their allies, black allies, as citizens, right, as legally recognized subjects. So Sarah Ramond was one of these women. As a child, her parents had tried to enroll her at a private school in Salem. And just not to get too deep into it, but um, private schools were thought to offer a higher quality education. So Sarah's parents wanted her to go to a private school, but she was barred from all the private schools that she had submitted applications because she was black. Instead, she and her two youngest sisters attended Salem's public primary schools. So what's important here is that Salem's public primary schools were not racially segregated in the 18, late 1820s and early 1830s. Sarah and her sisters wanted to extend their studies at the recently established high school for girls. So they took the high school entrance examination and they passed. Some white uh, Salem residents recoiled at the presence of the Ramon sisters at the high school. They petitioned the school committee to expel the colored girls and to create a separate school for African-American children and youth. And then what the school committee did in response was they sanctioned that plan. And so a separate school was established. So one of the questions I was wrestling with in my research was why did the town and the school committee suddenly shift toward racially segregated schools? After all, Sarah had attended um, Salem's public primary schools alongside her white classmates. So what had changed? And I found the answer. Competition was the issue. Sarah and her sisters excelled at their studies. And Sarah in particular stood out. She displayed good character according to her teacher and made it to the top of her class. White Salem residents wished to get Sarah, quote, out of the way, as one observer noted. Essentially, white parents had underestimated the intelligence and ability of Sarah Ramond and her sisters, believing that they possessed neither the aptitude nor the inclination to ever surpass their, to ever surpass their white daughters. But Sarah did, and white residents banished her and all African-American children from white schools. So Sarah reflected on this experience later in life. And she said her strongest desire through life was to be educated. And her expulsion from this high school dashed her hopes. Here are, are her words, which I'll read from the slide. 
I had no words for anyone. I only wept bitter tears. Then in a few minutes, I thought of the great injustice practiced upon me and longed for some power to help me crush those who thus robbed me of my personal rights. Sarah, like many young African-American women, was a knowledge seeker. To be a knowledge seeker was to possess an enthusiasm for learning, a strong sense of curiosity, being ambitious and thoughtful, and craving that intellectual vitality. She was angered and frustrated that she had been expelled from this high school for no reason except her blackness. And just as an addendum to this, um, she ended up leaving the United States and moving um, first to the UK and then to Italy where she um, worked as a practicing physician. Um, later in life, she never came back to the United States. As Salem wrestled with the issue of racial segregation in the 1830s and 1840s, so too did Nantucket. Eunice Ross was born in Nantucket around 1823, 1824, and she had attended the segregated African school where she mastered multiple subjects, gained fluency in, in French, by all accounts, she was a star pupil. And she aspired to advance her studies at the newly established Nantucket High School. And she had a lot of, um, a lot of help or at least support from her teacher, Anna Gardner. A prospective student had to pass an entrance exam. In 1840, Eunice Ross passed that exam but the school committee rejected her because she was black. Nathaniel Barney, a white Quaker abolitionist and member of the Nantucket School Committee, called Eunice Ross the best qualified to enter of any that did apply. Such remarks again affirmed black aptitude and disproved racist myths about black intellectual inferiority. Five years later, in June 1845, another African-American girl entered the struggle for equal school rights, 17-year-old Phoebe Ann Boston. She applied for admissions to um, Nantucket High School, um, and she was deemed qualified, which means she probably passed the entrance, entrance exam as well, but the school committee rejected her. So in all of these instances, right, we have Sarah Ramond, Eunice Ross, and Phoebe Ann Boston, we see these young women are intelligent and high achieving. They each mastered subjects such as geography and arithmetic, English grammar, writing and reading, right? They were star students. And each had prepared to take the high school entrance exam and they passed. So these young women were in pursuit of knowledge to expand their mind and to realize their ambition. Some of them even aspired to become teachers, which was considered a noble and purposeful profession. A teacher's aim was to train the rising generation. And in the African-American community, teaching was regarded as service to the race. So many of these African-American women were hoping to become teachers. Denying these young women access to a public high school deprived them of educational opportunities equal to those available to white children and youth. So activists pursued a range of protest strategies, as I mentioned before, from boycotting schools to filing lawsuits. And their goal was to reform and democratize education. In Salem and then two protest tactics, boycotting and petitioning. 
In both Salem and Nantucket, African Americans petitioned the local school committee and the Massachusetts State Legislature. Eunice Ross authored an 83 word petition demonstrating her knowledge of community affairs and her sophistication. You can see here her neat penmanship, right, as she writes about her story. Passing the entrance exam proved that she was amply qualified to attend Nantucket High School. But the school committee voted to deny her admission because she was Black. Her account was factual and straightforward, not to mention similar to other equal school rights petitions filed by African American activists in the 1840s and 1850s. Generally, three tropes characterized these equal school rights petitions. First, there was a declaration of local and state citizenship. You have um, African Americans in the language of the 19th century calling themselves colored citizens. Second, there was a denunciation of segregation, racial segregation as an injustice, as insulting, as an injury, right? It was a major grievance. And you can see some of that language used in the words of Sarah Parker Ramond. And third, there was an invocation of state law, which could quote unquote protect African Americans and resolve this issue. What is notable here is that these equal school rights petitions, along with a separate lawsuit and a boycott, actually led to the racial integration of the Nantucket public school system in 1846. And two years before that, in 1844, a, pen, a petition campaign in Salem saw that city integrate its public schools. So you can see the activism of these girls and women led to direct change. African American women's educational activism also intersected with the suffrage movement. This is a story I don't talk about in the book um, because I found out um, a little bit later, but it is really um, a sobering story nonetheless. It's the story of Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin, an African-American suffragist and editor of the Women's Era newspaper. As a child, Josephine St. Pierre was caught up in the equal school rights fight in Boston, right, in the early 1850s. She attended and graduated from a predominantly white primary school. She was ambitious to learn, in her words, and excited about furthering her education at one of Boston's all-white public grammar schools. But the Boston School Committee refused to let her matriculate because she was Black and the schools were segregated. So Joseph, the grammar schools were. So Josephine's white primary school teacher resolved to teach Josephine advanced subjects, which she would have learned in grammar school, while Josephine remained at the all white primary school in the position of monitor. So she would be watching over um, the younger children. Josephine recalled that as an eight year old, her white classmates started to mock her and tease her in the article here, she says, the children of the school taunted me. They said I was put back. They flattened their noses against the window panes at recess time and called me teasing names, including a racial slur. She said she was wounded beyond endurance. So she ended up going to school in Salem, Massachusetts. She eventually returned to Boston and did most of her activist work in Boston, but she had a clear goal, given what she had experienced, of fighting against both racial and gender prejudice. The point here is that children like Josephine 
endured awful abuse and were in fact traumatized um, as they were in pursuit of knowledge. Neither Phoebe Boston nor Eunice Ross ever attended Nantucket High School, at least from the records we have. Sarah Ramond never returned to the public high school in Salem. But these young women enabled other children to learn in racially integrated spaces. Their stories are a reminder of the importance of placing African American children in these educational narratives about the United States. And it makes sense that the black girl became a fundamental part of the iconography of school desegregation in the 20th century, as she had been in the 19th century. The activism of Sarah Ramond, Eunice Ross, Phoebe Boston, and Josephine St. Pierre spurred the racial integration of public school systems in the state of Massachusetts. And I would add, led to the passage of a law in 1855 that forbade racial exclusion or race to be used as a factor in the admission of students to public schools throughout the state. Activists in Salem were in conversation with activists in Nantucket, who knew what was happening in Boston. These are the networks that I talk about in my book. So these campaigns were not simply local, but rather regional, and they were spearheaded by African American girls and women. The educational activism of these young women took different forms, from writing um, and petitioning and organizing to lecturing and boycotting. Yet no matter their form of activism, there were two common principles that drove them. The first is that they refused to accept the idea that the existing educational system was the best possible. For them, the fight for equal school rights, that is the right to a quality education on an equal basis, was a matter of freedom and justice. And second, they were inspired to reform American schooling and teaching in ways that were inclusive, transformative, and respectful. These same principles motivate educational activists today who carry on the fight for equal school rights in the United States. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really great. Um, and I just, I love the story of integration on, of education on the island. Um, and I just was wondering, so we do have some questions coming in, but I'm going to lead with um, my own. And so I just I think it's really remarkable, right, the way in which the African American community on the island um, kind of rallied together for their children's education, right? Because you talk about the Ramans re in your book relocating for their children's advanced schooling. But here, you know, we have this community who not only built a school for their children before the public school system was even established on the island, but you know, once the school system was here, they were very involved in advocating for integration and for providing these schooling opportunities. And I'm just wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about that. It's not really a question, but it's just something that I think is really interesting. Yes, absolutely. That was one of my um, findings, which I didn't really expect to, to find, um, that the African school existed before the creation of public schools in Nantucket. And I think it goes to show that African Americans felt deeply and strongly about educating um, their children. And when I looked at um, the petition, so there's Eunice Ross's petition, but then there are also a couple of other petitions that are filed in support of her. I'm also seeing a high rate of literacy, right? So even if that education is not happening in the African school, it's happening in other spaces. Um, so there could be literary societies, right? There could be other types of educational societies, and there could just be sort of going on in the home. And that seemed to be something that was very important to African Americans um, in Nantucket. Mm 
Yeah, which I just think is, is really interesting. And something else you talked about in your book, there's just a brief mention, but I did not know about. Um, so you say that in 1843, there was another unnamed girl who took the entrance exam. And so she wasn't admitted, as we know. Um, but I'm just wondering if you can tell us more about her, even if we don't know a lot. Right. So um, one of the things I noticed in writing this book is that there were these great discoveries. Um, I talk about the Young Ladies Domestic Seminary in upstate New York, um, the first racially integrated female seminary in the North. And I was happy to stumble upon that. No historian had really written about that institution. But I also had these moments where I couldn't find more, right, about a particular subject or a particular moment. And this is, that was one of them, where there was this girl from 1843 who took, it seems, the entrance exam and did not pass. And I can't find out more about her. I don't know who she was. I think it's significant though, um, in the two names that we have, Eunice Ross and Phoebe Boston, that there is a third person and there could be more and that they were all trying to break this barrier. So even though we don't know her name, we know that she's sort of part of this network of African-American girls and women fighting for equal school rights. And I can only imagine the kind of pressure she felt when she went in to take that exam, right? Because she had sort of the weight of the community on her shoulders and she didn't pass. And what was that like for her? Um, so we can only imagine it as, you know, as historians, it's, we can't go further than that, but her story is part of this larger um, effort. Very true. And you also make the point as well that, you know, just because she didn't pass, she also didn't have maybe the same schooling opportunities to provide her with that strong foundation to, to pass the exam as well. Um, and my, my last question that I have, um, I also, I thought it, this was just also another, I, what I liked about the book is that, you know, I, I feel like I'm, and many people that are here tonight as well are familiar with the story of integration of the schools on Nantucket. Um, but I feel like even, and, and so I go into the book thinking, what, well, what else is there? Uh, and yet, right, like there's an unnamed third girl I wasn't aware of. And another thing that I just hadn't thought about was you talked about this like unrelenting African-American agitation, right, for school integration. And then you say specifically that the rejection of Phoebe Ann Boston from the high school converted some indecisive white Nantucket residents with great respect for the Boston family. And I just personally hadn't thought about that perspective that the Boston family standing in the community, right, might differ from, well, did differ from the standing of the Eunice, Eunice Ross and her family and the impact that that might have had on the broader white community. And I'm just wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit more about that. Right, I was surprised to find that too. And um, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that Absalom Boston had been involved in the Nant greater Nantucket community and was well respected um, in Nantucket. And so when his daughter applied to go to this high school and had passed the entrance exam and was rejected, I think there was quite a bit of sympathy for her. So here's where we might talk a little bit about class, right, and class okay. issues. Um, Eunice Ross's parents, her father was a laborer. He was, um, as far as we can tell, in, I think in one of the slides I showed the census record, it says he was born in Africa. Um, so they're of a slightly different class. Um, compared to, I think, the Boston family and Absalom Boston. And that made a little bit of a difference. That made a little bit of a difference and I think converted some of those white residents in Nantucket to support um, school integration. There aren't very many moments when we're looking at the 19th century North and looking at Black communities where we can talk about class. Um, and it's, it gets really messy because it sort of intersects with race and gender. Um, but I think that's one of the few manis, manifestations that you see, that the Boston family had a particular status. Um, and that status um, over time led some white residents to change their opinions about um, racial school integration. Yeah, that's so interesting, thank you. Um, so one of the questions we've had come in is just in Massachusetts in general, can you talk about um, a little bit about the timeline by which different towns were desegregating their school systems and which was the first town and was Nantucket an outlier or ahead of the curve? That's a great question. So it, in my research, it appears that um, smaller towns did not um, segregate their schools. They may have segregated their classrooms. 
So African American children were sometimes pushed toward one side of the classroom or confined to a corner. We have some examples of that. Um, so that's in smaller towns. In larger cities, um, th there may have been a, a policy of racial segregation. Um, but part of what I want to show in talking about Salem is that that policy wasn't a foregone conclusion. Um, so Salem's schools, as I mentioned, were racially um, desegregated and they become racially exclusive only later, right, in, eight, in the 18, um, late 1830s. So Salem is the first municipality to integrate its schools in 1844. Nantucket follows quickly in 1846. I would argue that, and then Boston follows much later um, in 1855. So if we're thinking about those three cities, Nantucket, Nantucket's right in the middle, um, but we also have to realize that there were other um, towns and, and cities that had no policy toward racial segregation. Um, I'm thinking about a, like New, New Bedford. Um, in my research, I found no um, policy for racial school segregation. Interesting. Um, oh, so another question. Did Sarah Raymond have any support for a teacher from a teacher such as um, Eunice Ross had with Anna Gardner? Um, no, I found no record of that. She had a sympathetic teacher um, who felt bad that he had to expel her. He had a conversation with um, her, her parents and, you know, he lamented what, what was, you know, what had to occur. Um, his name was Rufus Putnam, but uh, it wasn't, it's not clear to me that he did anything aside from that. Um, and that's unfortunate, but it, you know, I think it also goes to show um, how unique Anna Gardner was in supporting Eunice Ross. Um, as I mentioned, there was also a white female teacher in Boston who supported Josephine St. Pierre. And so you see some of that happening, but it's really rare. And those teachers are putting their careers on the line and sometimes their lives. Um, Prudence Crandall um, put her life on the line in some ways um, to open up her school for African-American girls and women in Connecticut. So this was definitely activist work um, and it was dangerous work. Thanks. I think that's a really interesting perspective to have, too, just because, um, especially here at the NHA, where we have released a biography of Anna Gardner this year, just realizing, um, you know, that that was not, you know, her, her departure from the African school was not necessarily like a standard life choice um, that she made. Um, so we know, so you, obviously your presentation, you talk about um, several young women who tried to to break this racial barrier uh, for equal education. And were there any young black men who also uh, made this effort? Yes, so there are quite a few stories of um, young black men, particularly as in the 19th century, we have the rise of colleges and universities and young black men were able to take advantage of that on a very limited scale. Um, so we usually have maybe one or two um, if we think about a place like Bowdoin, um, John Russworm attended Bowdoin. Um, you had Edward Mitchell, I believe, at, um, I wanna say Amherst. Um, so some of the New England Hilltop colleges accepted one or two young African-American men every couple of years. Um, but we also have incidents. Um, there's a story of Charles Ray he was an editor of the Colored American, which is a newspaper for African Americans. And um, he had a very terrible experience. He had attended Wesleyan for a couple of weeks and the student body there said, if, you know, if he's not removed, right, there's going to be, you know, violence. There's, you know, and um, he was basically run out of town. So we do have examples of um, African American youth trying to, you know, get an education and being, um, you know, pushed back. Um, I know Dartmouth College um, accepted a few African-American men 
um, Mitchell attended, I'm not, yeah, I'm getting them a little bit mixed up, but yeah. Um, so Dartmouth, Bowdoin, Amherst, um, Williams accepted um, just a few, just a few. I think one of the stats that I read was that before the Civil War, there may be 30 to 40 graduates, black graduates um, from New England universities and colleges. Right, so that excludes a place like Oberlin, where there are far more black graduates. Um, but in New England, there are about 30, 30 to 40 black graduates, mostly male, if not all male. Oh, sure, yes. Okay, thanks. So what would you say is the biggest impact these young activists made, even though many of them did not make it into the schools they fought to attend? I think that was actually one of the surprising parts of this work. I had hoped to read a more triumphant story that at the end of this, Eunice Ross would take her place at Nantucket High School, that Sarah Ramon would take her place at um, you know, the high school in Salem. And I think what's important about their contributions is that they were oh, they opened up a path for the you know, future generation. Um, and they, they did so in ways um, using forms of activism that were available to them. So of course, this is the 19th century. Um, there are prescribed rules for women. There are particular characteristics that they're supposed to possess. And um, African-American girls and women are working within those limitations. Um, but they joined the boycott you know, for, of um, the schools in, in Nantucket and Salem and Boston they petition. Um, and that was, you know, a huge thing for them to do. And I think shows you and gives a sense of their um, sense of um, citizenship, right, that they have a right to petition, um, that they have a right to seek protection, to seek redress from um, the state. And so even if, you know, among people who are marginalized, um, they're still fighting, right, and they're choosing paths that, you know, that are open to them or that they try to open. Um, and that's one of the things that I take away from these young women. Um, they, I like to say sometimes that they try to make a way out of no way. Um, and so there's something very inspirational about um, their activism. Oh, I mean that, yes, <laughs> that's just so poignant. Um, and I, I think such a good point about that, that sense of citizenship and that, that feeling engaged in a community mm -hmm. that isn't necessarily like trying to, to make you feel a part of it, you know, that you're saying, no, like this is my community too. And I want, I want my space um, within that. And it's, it is really inspiring. Um, it is also the last question that we had come in. So if, if there are any final questions, um, now is the time. But otherwise, um, this has just been delightful. Thank you. So I mean, at, at the same time, a very heavy topic. Um, but I think just really encouraging um, to just hear about and th to know that there's also just from like a historical perspective that there's always there's always more to learn. There's always another um, approach that we could take. Do you know that we maybe feel like the story is familiar to us, but you know, there's still always something new to learn out there. Um, oh, yes. Okay. The next question that's coming is just said, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and so I just want to say that um, we both thank you all tonight for joining us and to join us on January 5th to hear from Carl Wetzel and Dr. Mary Lynn Rainey on the archaeological collections of the NHA and the grant funded work taking place to interpret and provide access to these unique materials. Um, thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us. Thank you, um, Cabrera, for spending your evening with us. And programs such as this one are made possible thanks to the support of our members. If you're not a member, please consider joining by heading to the NHA.org website slash membership. Thank you and have a great night. <laughs>